Hello, brothers and sisters. Hope you're doing well. Today we are exploring the third consequence that Jesus mentions for those who reject his kingdom of grace. Two days ago, we looked at those who will be cast into outer darkness and will have weeping and gnashing of teeth as they are cast out from the presence of Jesus, who is the light of the world, and they re re realize with, with anger that their hopes are dashed for what they had been hoping for in their destiny. Then we looked yesterday at those who will experience torment and anguish before the King of glory when they stand before his judgment seat. But Jesus is wanting to cast out that fear and torment from our hearts through his perfect love. And I hope you are experience that in, experiencing that right now in your life by his grace. Today we want to tackle the third phrase that Jesus would often use for those who would reject his grace. And it's found over and over again, Jesus mentions them being cast into fire, what we would today often call the fires of hell, hell fire. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 to 30, Jesus says, If your right hand and your right eye cause you to sin, then cut it off, pluck it out, and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you to that one of your members perish, members of your body, body part perish, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Notice that Jesus says there'll come a moment for those who reject his love and his grace, they continue rebelling in their self-centeredness and their hard-heartedness, that they were, their whole body will be cast into hell. It is popular today to, in, in much of Christianity to believe, and as well as in other religions, that we innately have an immortal soul. But if you look throughout the entire Old Testament and New Testament, the Bible says there is only one who has immortality, and that is the king. He alone has immortality. And as we said yesterday in Romans chapter 2, Paul tells us that immortality is something that we must seek as humans, and it is only found in the king, in Jesus. And it is found through his grace. Jesus would say that um, one day soon, this is John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, that all who are in the graves will hear the voice of Jesus. And for those who have done good, they will come forth to the resurrection of life. For those who have done evil, they will come forth from the grave to the resurrection of condemnation. The Bible actually says, Old Testament, that, though, that when we die, our spirit uh, can also be translated breath. The breath of life returns to God who gave it, and our bodies return to the dust. Well, Genesis tells us we were formed in dust, and the Bible says that when we die, our bodies return to the dust. So for us to be cast into, for the wicked, the evil, the unrepentant, the rejecters of his grace, for them to be cast into hellfire, their whole body, that implies there must be a resurrection of the body for that to happen. The Bible tells us that the resurrection will happen for the righteous at the return of Jesus. We'll study that tomorrow, Lord willing. And for the wicked, Revelation chapter 20 says the second resurrection happens of condemnation a thousand years later, after the millennium. And you can read that in Revelation chapter 20. But notice that Jesus says those who reject his grace... They will be resurrected. They'll come forth bodily from the grave in the resurrection of condemnation. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, Jesus would look to the religious leaders of his days, the Pharisees and the scribes, these hypocrites, and he would call them serpents, this brood of vipers. And he asked them, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? So those who reject Jesus's love and grace, and they ultimately will be resurrected bodily in the resurrection of condemnation, the condemnation they will experience is the fires of hell. Uh, John the Baptist warned that this coming Messiah, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, he warned those who heard his preaching to bear fruit worthy of repentance. So the hard-hearted, the wicked will not repent, but for those who will repent, their life will bear fruit. And so John the Baptist in his preaching was calling for people to bear fruit worthy of repentance. And do not say to yourselves that we have Abraham as our father. They, the, the people in Jesus' day believed that because of their lineage, because they were uh, Hebrews, Israelites, children of Israel, Jewish descent, uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they were already automatically in the kingdom. 
And so John the Baptist challenges that by saying, don't say that we have father, or Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. But even now, John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, even now the axe is being laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus would agree that a time is coming. He would agree with John the Baptist. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 19, as we studied in the Sermon on the Mount a few weeks ago, it says, every tree, Jesus says, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Over and over again, Jesus tells us that the ultimate destiny of the wicked, the rebellious, the evil, the self-centered and self-seeking will be uh, hellfire. But notice when that hellfire will be. Jesus does not tell us that hellfire is burning right now. I know many believe that, but that is not the teaching of Jesus. Notice Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. Jesus would tell the story of the wheat and the tares. The wheat are the ones planted by God. The tares are the ones planted by the evil one here in this kingdom of grace, in this fallen world. And it says, as the tares will be gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Hellfire, Jesus says, is at the end of this age. The Son of Man, he says, Matthew 13, verse 41, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Notice they have not experienced the new covenant. The law of God is not being written upon their hearts and minds out of God's grace. They are still refusing to come into harmony with God and his will as ways. They continue to be selfish and self-centered. And it says he will cast them into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So again, Jesus combining the, the anger, gnashing of teeth, the weeping and wailing for what they have lost together with this fire imagery. But Jesus specifically says that it is at the end of this age that this will happen. In Matthew 13, another parable Jesus says in verses 47, 48, 49, and 50, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew it to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but they threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Again, Jesus telling us that right now, the righteous are sleeping in their graves, and the wicked are sleeping in their graves. This is the predominant term for death in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, Jesus, when he described the death of his dear friend Lazarus, said he is asleep in John chapter 11. But I go that I may wake him up because I am the resurrection and the life. One day, John chapter 5, everybody who is in the grave will hear his voice. Some will rise to the resurrection, bodily resurrection of, <clears throat> the, of eternal life, and others will bodily resurrect to the resurrection of condemnation. And those who are condemned will be thrown into the furnace of fire. And Jesus says in these two parables in Matthew 13, at the end of the age, when the angels separate the good from the bad. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament describe our God as a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, and Deuteronomy 4, verse 24. God himself is an everlasting, eternal fire that it can never be quenched. And whatever comes into its presence that is out of harmony with it will be consumed. Our God is a consuming fire, Old Testament and New Testament. This is why in Luke chapter 3, verse 17, John the Baptist again says, his winnowing fan is in his hand, this coming Messiah, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Now that phrase, unquenchable, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27, God prophesied that his people would reject him and that ultimately the Babylonians would come in and conquer Jerusalem. They would destroy it and the temple, which they did, and God prophesies through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, verse 27, that I will kindle a fire in the gates of Jerusalem and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. An unquenchable fire is a one that no human being can put out. But notice that 
God tells through Jeremiah that that unquenchable fire will devour, just as it devoured the city of Jerusalem. In the end, the wicked will be consumed. They will be devoured. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7, The heavens and the earth, which are now being reserved by the same word, the world was one time destroyed completely by the global flood, and God preserved Noah and his family in the ark. And in the end, by that same judge, word of judgment that once destroyed the world by water, it is now being reserved for fire, 2 Peter 3 verse 7 says, until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. A fire that will destroy this world and the wicked uh, in the very end, just like God destroyed it once by the global flood. But in verse 12 of that same chapter, 2 Peter 3, we're looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. This is an unquenchable fire that no power on earth can put out until it is completely melted and dissolved and destroyed, devoured and consumed everything that God intends it to, to destroy. Sodom and Gomorrah. From the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, uh, the New Testament writers describe that the fate of the wicked will be just like those in Sodom and Gomorrah. In Jude chapter 1, verse 7, Jude tells us that just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So notice this eternal, everlasting fire that is unquenchable. Notice that it destroys. Uh, it's no Sodom and Gomorrah no longer burning. So it burned, it consumed, it devoured uh, what God sent it to accomplish. In fact, 2 Peter 2 verse 6 says that God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, and making them an example of those who would afterward live ungodly. So notice the resurrection of condemnation results in them being thrown into a fire that reduces them to ashes and they are condemned to destruction. That is the fate of the wicked. According to Jesus at the end of this age, that is the fate of the wicked according to the New Testament. In 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7, the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Those who are cast out of the kingdom of glory when Jesus appears to sit upon the throne of his glory in all of his own glory and the glory of the holy angels, notice that they will be punished. Those who reject that and continue in their self-centeredness and rebellion and self-seeking, they will be punished with everlasting destruction. So again, the fires of hell at the end of this age will be fires that devour and consume and they destroy. This is because we are told that the wages of sin is not being tormented forever and ever in the fires of hell, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So today we have two options, the gift of eternal life or the wages of our own sins, which is an eternal death, according to Romans 6, verse 23. So the ultimate fate of the wicked will be that they will be cast into outer darkness, away from the presence of the one who is the light of the world. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth and anger at what they have missed, they will be tormented in God's presence with the, the fullness of their sins being realized until it snuffs out their life. And then their fires of hell will consume them and devour them, reducing them to ashes. That is the wages of sin. James chapter 1 verse 15 says that when uh, an evil desire, when we are tempted and an evil desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So those who are tormented in the presence of Jesus... That sin, that realization will ultimately go to the full extent and it will snuff out their life. Sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so the wicked will ultimately die in the presence of the judge of the earth. But Revelation 20 actually describes that moment when the wicked at the end of the millennium, the end of the thousand years, are resurrected and they, right before they stand before his white judgment seat, it says that the righteous will descend from heaven in the new Jerusalem and the wicked will be resurrected and all of them will go out on the breadth of the earth and surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire will come down from God out of heaven and devour them. Revelation chapter 20 verse 9. 
of that same chapter, verse 14. Notice the fire of hell comes down and it consumes, it devours the wicked. Death in Hades, death in the grave, that word Hades means grave. Death in the grave will also be cast into the lake of fire and this is the second death. You and I, if we die before the return of Jesus, we experience the first death. But everyone on planet earth, righteous and wicked, good and evil, they will all be resurrected. Some to the resurrection of life, others to the resurrection of condemnation. But notice that the second death is when you die in front of the judgment seat of Christ, your own sins snuff out your life, and the fires of hell reduce the wicked to ashes. This is the second death in which there is no resurrection. It is an eternal death. In fact, verse 15 of Revelation 20 says, whoever is not found written in the book of life is cast into that lake of fire. Today, you and I can have our names in the Lamb's book of life. We can have our sins forgiven and wiped out, wiped clean, and uh, we can know God's love and his grace. But in Revelation 21, verse 8, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars will have their part in that lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice the fires of hell at the end of the age are described as a second death, not being tormented forever and ever and ever without end, but it's described ultimately there will be torment, there will be fire and flames, but it will end in a death in which they will no longer exist and no longer be resurrected. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, don't fear anybody on this planet who can kill you. The one we should fear he says, is the one who can kill both body and soul in hell. So notice that Jesus says he is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. The fires of hell will destroy both body and soul for the wicked. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, as Jesus stands on, sits on the seat of his uh, throne of his glory, and it's his judgment seat, it says he separates the sheep and the goat. He separates the wicked from the righteous, and the wicked, it says, will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It's not an everlasting punishing, it's an everlasting punishment, and that punishment is death. And the fires of hell will reduce them to ashes. In Psalm 37, verse 20, the wicked shall perish, the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish, and into smoke they will vanish away. We talked about yesterday and the day before, maybe the Revelation 14, that the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. So they'll be reduced, their torment will result in them being snuffed out, the fires of hell will come, and the smoke of their torment is all that will be left. And it says, like smoke, they will vanish away and perish. John 3.16, God so loved the world and he so loved you that he gave his son that whoever believes upon him should not perish die forever and ever and ever in eternal death, reduced to ashes and smoke, but that you would have everlasting life. That is God's desire for you, and I hope that is your desire. You see, Malachi, the Old Testament ends in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, saying that, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble, and the day will, is coming will burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. It will leave neither root nor branch, but you who fear my name... So those who live in reverence and awe before God, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like uh, stall, fed, stall fed calves, but you shall trample the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Jesus says a day is coming when the son of righteousness, Jesus, will arise in all of his glory. For the righteous, it will be a day of healing. But for the wicked, it will be like fire and stubble that consumes them and reduces them to ashes. Malachi 4, verses 1 to 3. Again, Matthew 25, verse, uh, verse 41, Jesus tells those on his left hand, the, the goats, the wicked, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In Revelation 20, verse 10, it says that the devil himself, who deceived this entire world, will himself be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And again, that's translated best until the end of this age, uh, because in Revelation 21 and 22 is a new age, a new heavens and a new earth in which only righteousness dwells. 
So what happens even to the devil as he is being tormented day and night until the end of this age? Ezekiel 28 verses 13 to 19 says, The devil, before he fell from heaven, he was an anointed cherub closest to God's throne. And God says that he will bring forth a fire that will devour Lucifer, the devil, consume him, and turn him to ashes upon the earth in the sight of the righteous, and he shall be no more forever. So Ezekiel 28 13 to 19 tells us that ultimately the lake of fire, hell will even burn up the devil after he is tormented. He will end up being no more forever and ever. Jesus would tell us in John 15 verse 6 that if anyone does not abide and remain in Jesus, he says he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. So today, Jesus does not want that, even though he says that is the consequence, that in a fire that results in just ashes and smoke is all that is left, and we will be no more forever, including the devil and his demons. But Jesus says the key is to abide and remain in him. And as you abide and remain in him, you will not wither, but you will grow and you will flourish and you will bear fruit to the glory of God. Jesus would say in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, that No one, having put your hand to the plow and looking back, no one like that is fit for the kingdom. Those who are fit for the kingdom are keeping their eyes on Jesus and they're plowing the fields of of this world, seeking to be fruit bearers for his kingdom and glory. And they keep their eyes on Jesus. They remain and abide in him and they do not look back. And Jesus says, those who, who keep on keeping on, those are fit for the kingdom. Who are the ones that are going to live forever in everlasting fire? It's not the wicked because they will be consumed. Isaiah actually tells us that it is the righteous. Isaiah chapter 33 verses 14 and 17 says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. This is what we talked about in the last couple days, that standing before God, there is a torment in this fearfulness. And the question is asked in Isaiah 33, 14 to 17, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Isaiah's answer is, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes. He who stops his ears from the hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. This is the one who will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. And your eyes will see the king in all of his beauty. Those who will live and dwell with the devouring fire. Our God is a consuming fire. He is the everlasting fire. And those who will dwell with everlasting burnings are the righteous. And their eyes, your eyes and mine, by God's grace, will be able to see the king in all of his beauty, in all of his glory. And we will be able to forever look into the face of the one who is a consuming fire. And you and I will dwell in his presence forever. The wicked, the rebellious, they will be consumed and reduced to ashes and smoke. But the righteous... In the glory of his presence, like the sun of righteousness rising, we will find healing in his presence and we'll be able to look upon the king in all of his beauty and live forever in his gloriously burning presence. That, my friends, is moving from the kingdom of grace into the kingdom of glory and forever beholding the king of glory. Our own eyes can see him. Today, I pray that you will choose to forever live in the presence of of the eternal burning one. And uh, I pray today that you will not end up with the wicked in the fires of hell that will reduce us to ashes. May you and I live in the eternal fire before the King of glory, and may we do it with joy. May this be your experience and mine. Thanks for joining us today. I know this was a long one, but may you be blessed and suffer not the consequences of rejecting God's kingdom of grace, but may you reap the rewards, being able to behold forever your king of glory and live forever in his eternally burning presence. May his heart of love burn within yours, and may you continue to grow and mature in his love, and with joy see him when he comes again soon and very soon. 
May this be your experience and mine, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.